how far would you go to make an impact in the world? This fall, 10 incredible entrepreneurs will visit our campus to tell their stories and share the steps they took to be catalysts for change. The 2021 Entrepreneur Leadership Series, the most valuable one credit class you will ever take. Enjoyed them as well. Uh, Ashley Smith had a great message about how good things are hard. Anything that is hard, anything that is good in life is hard and it takes a lot of work. And as she used the word messy, it's also messy. And so if you're trying to do something big and accomplish something, you got to know that it's going to be challenging, it's going to be hard, you have to be persistent. Then I loved how Russell Davies um, has really committed his life to helping veterans suffering from PTSD. And in that process of building that organization, he's basically healed himself. He's helped himself get better by helping other people. And then Arshay Cooper, how'd you like Arshay Cooper? It's pretty amazing. So I saw the movie, A Most Beautiful Thing, and uh, I was thinking about you, our students, and I said, we have got to get him to come to Utah State. And I thought, if I can get Arshay, great. If I can't get Arshay, I'm going to get Preston. If I can't get Preston, I'm going to get Alvin, but I'm going to get one of those guys here. And I meet, emailed Arshay, and he didn't respond. I emailed him, he didn't respond. I emailed him, he didn't respond. I found out he was in the hospital with COVID. And after about three weeks, his agent contacted me and said, hey, we're so sorry. We know you want Arshay to come, and we're going we're gonna to figure it out. We're going to figure it out. So we spent about a month figuring out how to get him here from New York. He was on the road 23 days last month. He had one day that he could come here, those two days that he was here. So I'm glad you got, got to see him and uh, meet him. We have another fabulous speaker tonight. Martin Fry is the only person on planet Earth who has climbed all seven summits and sailed all seven seas. But I'm going to let uh, Isaac introduce him more completely. But another phenomenal entrepreneur and a very successful individual with some great lessons to teach us. A couple of things. Um, we have a new form. See your new form? Let me get mine out here. Um, we've just changed it a little bit. We want you to, you know, some of you are, you're all turning these in, and when you turn them in, you get credit for being here. It doesn't matter what you write, as long as you write something. But we'd like you to be a little more thoughtful, and rather than say, oh, she started a dance academy, tell us what you learned. What is the principle that you learned? And to help you do that, think of an action verb, like serve, or apply, or instruct, or go, or teach, or th think of an action verb about what you've learned, and you can put that verb in the little box here. Uh, it's just so you can get a little bit more out of the class, all right? Um, one more thing is our sponsor of this lecture tonight is actually Culver's, and they're bringing frozen custard tonight. So sorry if you love Aggie ice cream. We love it too, but tonight it's Culver's custard. And uh, they're very generous to, to help us out. Now, they are... Uh, growing significantly across Utah. They're also looking for people to join their team and help out, and they'll be out in the foyer, and uh, they might even have a table with some literature, but uh, thank them for coming, and if you're interested, go ahead and talk to one of the people that show up from Culver's, okay? So I'm gonna let Isaac now introduce Martin to us. Thank you, Mike. So, Martin Frey is a successful business leader, tech entrepreneur, and as some might say, a professional adventurer. Um, as a mountaineer and sailor in April 2016, he set the Guinness World Record to be the first person to sail all the seven seas and climb the seven summits. Before this, he spent 13 years in Silicon Valley working as a senior director at Cisco, one of the world's largest tech companies. Um, following that, he worked in, with the governor in the Office of Economic Development, where he helped Utah businesses help those, help economic, Utah develop economically. Uh, Martin, Martin is passionate about developing the next generation of entrepreneurial leaders, and he is involved in many campuses across Utah. Um, he's also started a nonprofit called Summit Journeys, which helps youth to have adventurous experiences to help them develop better mental health and improve their own sense of self-esteem. Martin graduated from BYU in mechanical engineering, as well as Harvard and their advanced management degree. And he is currently studying positive, or working on a master's in positive psychology at, at Penn. Him and his family live in Holiday, Utah. So let's give it up for Martin. Thank 
Thanks, Isaac. Guys, I'm really pleased to be here with you tonight. And I'm honored that Mike would think of me to come uh, talk to you. And we're going to have fun tonight. And we're going to take you on some adventures. In fact, we're going to try and see if we can get up um, the seven summits and sail the seven seas and talk entrepreneurship all in the same time. So are you guys with me to go on a journey today, tonight? All right. So what I want to talk a lot about is something that has to do with what I call the adventure mindset. And I'm going to give you an example of that in this first little part. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this book. Um, it's a great book, but it's about doing the impossible. So take a look at that mountain for a second on the front of that book. And then I'm going to show you that mountain. It's called Ama de Blom in Nepal. And it's actually pretty close to Everest. And that ridge line down the left side is pretty tough with all that snow on there. And you can see a little more of the ridge line and kind of the facing this way. And when you're at the base of Ama de Blom, you look up and it just looks like, holy cow, how can I get up there? And not only that, that's not even close to the summit. That's just the first leg of the journey. So you start up and you work your way up this sheer cliff at the base. We stayed in a tent that was on about a five foot ledge and a straight drop. In fact, we had to take a cable over to get inside the tent. And we're working our way up this ridge line, and obviously you see all the snow fluting up at the top. <clears throat> we worked our way right up that edge, and I'll give you an, a, a little video of what it was like working our way up that ridge line by our, this is our lead guide. So we didn't make it up too far up that ridge line. We had to turn around and find another way. So instead of doing what would have been a first ascent, we had to back around and we climbed Ama de Blom. There I am, and there I am at the summit. In fact, looking under the prayer flags on the right is actually Mount Everest. So believe it or not, that's a lot like entrepreneurship. This idea of trying and having this big vision of where you want to go, being able to map out a plan to get there. We had to haul three miles of rope with us on the back of yaks up to 15,000 feet. And then as a team, we hauled it up the, that ridge line in order to build the safety lines to be able to do that. Didn't work out for us. We had to come back and find a different way forward, and we went around the south side of the mountain and summited Amit Blom from there. What some people perceive was an impossible climb, we found a way and we got there. And oftentimes, that's the way it is in business. There are lots of things that go wrong, things that are shaking you up. And so what I first want to share with you is what I think is one of the most important elements that you can remember, that life is a daring adventure. It's a big challenge. A lot of young people your age right now are suffering with anxiety. They're feeling like they can't be successful or they're not sure how to figure it out. What I'm going to share with you tonight is a lot about how do you have that adventure mindset and how can you say, look at life as a grand adventure and say, bring it on. I'm going to take challenge myself. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I'm going to jump into it. I have a huge advantage. I can look back on my life and I can see a gazillion validation points that said, wow, Martin, you pulled this off. I can't believe you did that. You all may not have as many of those experiences yet. So the idea of looking forward is a little murky. It's a little foggy about how things are all going to come together. Trust this process, this unfolding chapter by chapter in your life. And when you're my age, you'll look back and you go, wow, I can't believe all those decisions that we made that I didn't know if I was making the right decision. It all works out so beautifully. It's like your subconscious mind just 
optimizes exactly the right path forward for each of you. That's what we're talking about tonight. You with me? All right. Now, to keep this interesting, I'm going to show you uh, uh, what a friend of mine likes to do. And we talk a lot about anxiety and we talk about facing our fears. And it's some of the biggest things that hold entrepreneurs back. So I'm going to set this up with yeah, this little clip. Yeah, buddy. Notice that was a that was a uh, double back uh, double flip. Go ahead. Turn it on. You see the switch there? Yeah. All right. So Clark, that's pretty impressive. Woo! Um, I would have been scared out of my mind. Uh, by the way, Clark Robinson. How old are you, by the way? I'm 25. 25. So uh, have you been to school? Yeah. So I graduated a couple years ago from the University of Utah. All right. Um, GoPro sponsors him around the world, so does Red Bull, and he goes around and he, he gets to do all this fun stuff. How, how'd you learn that, man? Um, so when I was at the University of Utah, uh, I developed a few uh, interesting and unique hobbies. Um, but to clear the waters, I'm not sponsored by Red Bull, so he's... Oh, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, I like, <laughs> not yet. I've gotten a few free ones at events, but that's about it. <laughs> But uh, yeah, when I was at the University of Utah, uh, I developed some interesting hobbies. Um, I've always been a really passionate skier, and uh, I would see people um, in the ski movies doing big ski base jumps with parachutes. So one day I was like, hey, I'm gonna try and see if I can figure that out. So I started skydiving in college, and uh, that really took over. And uh, I discovered this world of air sports. So one of my biggest passions is human air sports. And uh, that includes base jumping and wingsuiting and speed flying and paragliding and all these sports. So a lot of the time when people see videos like this, uh, they'll say, oh man, you must be crazy, that's so much risk. And uh, I imagine it's really similar to being an entrepreneur or a businessman. A lot of the time, if someone's going to go out and start a business, uh, people will be like, oh, you're crazy, you won't have security, you could fail. Um, and so I get a lot of people asking me questions about risk and how dangerous it is uh, to do these sports. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that and a little bit about wingsuit base jumping today. And to tee that off, uh, maybe we'll show this next video. Okay. Up here on top of the Iger. Woohoo! Florian, Chris, super beautiful day. Sunny, no wind. Took us a few hours to get up here. It's an awesome hike. And now we're about to send it. Yeah! Woo! It's so high they talk like Mickey Mouse. So the Eiger, if you don't know, is in Switzerland. It's a really cool mountain. I've uh, climbed it, but uh, he's got a better way to get down. We're here. In five, Dave. Five, Dave. Three, two, one. So, dude, who's ready to try that, by the way? We talk about taking risks. No? How come, Adam? It's crazy, right? So let's ask Clark, is it crazy? Do you think, how many people think that's crazy? I do. All right. So, so Clark, dude, how, how do you do, how do you do this, right? <laughs> Well, is this is this all about like no fear or what's it like? Uh, definitely scared. Yeah, I'm nervous the whole time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it seems like a lot of the coolest or most awesome things in life 
an unfortunate uh, side effect of that is that they're really scary to do. You know, whether it is wingsuit base jumping or climbing big mountains or starting a business or asking a girl out on a date, <laughs> whatever it is, I feel like a lot of the time the most awesome stuff is really scary. And so uh, there's definitely a lot of fear involved with this. Um, but there's a lot of steps we do to mitigate the risk. And a lot of things that happen behind the scenes uh, that a lot of people don't see when they see wingsuit base jumping, usually you just see the high fives at the bottom or us like screaming on top of the Iger mushroom being goofballs or like the rock and roll soundtracks, these sweet uh, like films. Like Instagram. Yeah, like you just see Instagram, but you don't see everything that goes into it. So. I'm going to just walk you guys through a wingsuit base jump, and I actually think there's a lot of commonalities uh, between wingsuit base jumping and being an entrepreneur or pursuing success in whatever endeavor that may be. Um, so let's uh, pretend like you're doing a wingsuit base jump, you're with your buddies, you're on top of this huge drop, it's hundreds of feet to thousands of feet in front of you, and you're wearing a wingsuit, you're about to jump. Uh, like what's going through your mind, uh, what have you done to prepare for that moment? So. Uh, the, the first thing that's going on is you have skills. You have to have the skills to be there in the first place. So for us to do a jump like this in a wingsuit, uh, we've done hundreds if not thousands of skydives. We've prepared jumping out of planes. We've flown our wingsuit so many times we know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, the next thing is people always ask us like, oh, do you just like land on your belly in a wingsuit? But we have these parachutes <laughs> and we have these uh, methods uh, to be able to not only pull this off once, but to be able to do it over and over and over again. So when we're up there on top of the cliff, uh, we have the right tools for the job. So we're wearing our wingsuits and then we also have uh, parachutes on our back. Um, and these parachutes we've really meticulously packed, we've done all of the gear maintenance, and then also we always do something before we jump called a gear check. And so um, after we were done screaming, when we got on top of that mushroom, uh, we always go over each other's gear. So we'll check each other out, uh, we'll make sure uh, all of the equipment is in the proper order. Um, and so when you're, on the, when you're on the edge of the cliff, uh, you already know you've put in the work. You know that you can fly your wingsuit. How do you know you can fly? How do you know you can do that? <laughs> yeah, so you know that you can fly in the sky, right? You have and lasers so, and GPS? Yeah, so you know you have the skills, you know the tools. The other thing that we've done is the analysis. So um, it's not just a random, hey, there's a cliff. Let's see if we can jump off of that. Uh, with wingsuiting, it's actually a pretty interesting sport. Uh, when we're flying our wingsuits, uh, we'll wear these GPSs on our helmets. It's called a fly sight. But that tracks all of your measurements and all of your statistics wingsuit flying. So when you go to jump off of the cliff, uh, you've tracked all of your data. You know how long it takes you to drop, how long until you get to start flying, your glide profile, your speed. You have all these things. And then what we'll do is when we're wanting to jump off of a cliff, We'll approach the cliff and we'll take laser range finders and we'll actually build a terrain profile of the cliff and then we can map that together. So we'll have this overlay of, okay, this is what I look like when I'm flying a wingsuit. This is what this mountain looks like. And then here's my margin on all of these jumps. So um, that's very reassuring because sometimes when you're up in these mountains, you're standing on the edge of the cliff and you know it could be hundreds of feet, it could be thousands of feet, but we'll put together all of this analytical data um, so we know that there's a proper amount of margin. It's pretty similar if you're in business, I guess that would be your financial models or your risk analysis, that's what I compare it to the most. Um, and then the last thing that we do uh, when we're wingsuiting a mountain is we have a strategy. So it's not just, hey, we're standing on the edge of this cliff, we're gonna jump off and we're gonna see where we're gonna fly. We always have a very specific plan. So on this jump, as with my friend Dave, our plan was we were gonna jump off together and we fly a certain line. So we've looked on Google Earth and we've mapped out exactly where we're gonna jump, where we're gonna fly. We know how long it takes our parachutes to open. We know where we need to disconnect from the terrain with the proper amount of speed to actually deploy the parachutes and be safe. So knowing all this information, um, you know, we have the tools, we have the analysis, we have our strategy. Uh, the last thing that you need to do uh, is you need to execute. And, one of my very favorite parts is when you're standing on top of that cliff, you're with your good friends, you're in these beautiful areas, but uh, a common phrase we always say is we're like, all right, it's time to go be awesome. And we always do this handshake. And uh, that's kind of the thing that puts us in the zone. And there's like really no feeling like jumping off a cliff and flying with your friends. 
Um, and then as we're flying, we're, uh, we're always giving ourselves a backup option. So as we're flying, when we're getting close to this terrain, uh, we're always giving ourselves an out, is what we call it. So if we're trying to get close to the terrain, say there's a ridge like this, we'll be flying at the ridge, but if, at any point you don't have enough glide and you would impact the terrain, you can always turn downhill and fly out like that. And then the other thing I really love is um, you're committed. And so when you're wingsuit base jumping, it's really counterintuitive, but speed is actually the, the safest thing for you because the faster you're flying at any point, you can, you can fly up and get away from the terrain. And so we always call it like your hair's on fire and you're flying as fast as you can. So um, I think that the process of achieving a goal like this, it's been really fulfilling to me. And uh, I think it's um, just like anything in life, whether it's a business that you want to start or a wingsuit base jump or some other goal you want to achieve, uh, it's really fulfilling putting those steps together to be able to pull that off. And uh, ultimately, you just got to go for it after you've taken those steps. So thanks. For the, we'll have uh, some time with Clark in the Q&A at the end. Does that sound good? So <clears throat> for the rest of us, entrepreneurship is a daring adventure. And you know, I, I can't top that. So we could close now or we could keep talking about entrepreneurship. You guys game for that? Three keys to entrepreneurship that I think are really important and why adventure matters is this opportunity of adventure is these opportunities to step outside of our comfort zone, to embrace a new challenge for personal growth. And why do we want that? Uh, by the way, adventure has to include two elements. It has to include uh, risk, and it has to include uncertainty of success. Otherwise, we don't really grow from the experience. But when we do grow and we test ourselves by continually stepping outside our comfort zone, we build self-efficacy. This is a psychological term that our psychology uses that defines this belief system in ourselves, in our own capability that we can do hard things or achieve our outcomes in life. A lot of people who feel like they're a victim of circumstances have very low self-efficacy. The second one is self-determination. Self-determination means I'm going to figure out how to get this done. It's a skill set where self-efficacy is a belief system in yourself. And then finally, there's resilience. This what do you do when it goes wrong? And how do you pick yourself up and not only just get back on course, but how do you actually maybe map a better course or get, make more progress? And they actually often call that anti-fragility this opportunity to actually grow from adversity rather than just trying to recover. Those three, thing, those three terms could be summarized in a can-do, want-to, will-do attitude or a mindset that I call the adventure mindset. And as I've watched expeditions all over the world, I've seen more guys drop out of adventures because they didn't have an adventure mindset. They let their anxiety get the best of them. And so rather than being in a sales deal or closing a big deal, they shy away from taking some of those risks that do it. If you have that can do, I can do it. You believe that you can, otherwise you won't, you won't put forth the effort. If you want to, you'll find a way. And if you just say, I will do no matter what happens, you'll draw on your resilience. In fact, you'll find new reserves of strength to make you successful in life. One final comment on that. Entertainment, which our society loves here in the United States, is not adventure. Adventure teaches you problem solving, risk taking, decision making, all teamwork, collaboration. All of those things come together when we step outside of our comfort zone. Entertainment doesn't take you outside your comfort zone. It's fun, and it might be good for bonding with friends, but <clears throat> you miss out opportunity-wise, and that's why adventure matters. The other reason I share this with you is because more than anything, I want you all to be the hero in your own journey. I want you to be able to look at your life and say, wow, I did that. 
I, I, I can wingsuit, or I can build a business, or I can be successful in my life, wherever and whatever endeavor you choose to go after. Oh, by the way, that's me climbing a first ascent in Antarctica, in Antarctica. And I actually get to name that. I've got to contact the Royal Geographic Society. So <clears throat> one of the things I need to do, or that I want to share with you, is this idea of perceiving yourself as an entrepreneur. I, my first job was I took my red wagon when I was a little kid up and down the street. I was too young to have a paper route. And I went to people's homes who all got newspapers every night. And I collected newspapers. And I got $16 a ton at the recycling center. And I was 12, and I bought that sunfish sailboat. And I learned to sail. And one of the cool things about that experience was no matter which way the wind was blowing, I could make that boat go where I wanted it to go. This idea of managing the circumstances, and sometimes the wind would be crazy and the sails would be flapping, and as a little kid, I was able to take control of the circumstances and make it happen. That's what it'll be like in entrepreneurship. You guys will need to just wrestle through the challenges. There'll be a lot of unknowns, and you'll have to figure out how to get there. Those skills and those early skills have helped me all through my career. I worked in the defense industry or, uh, when I first graduated from engineering school at BYU, and that was great. We were building uh, electronic warfare systems for aircraft, and then I saw, you know, it was like maybe the 90s weren't going to be about uh, defense contracting. And I'm like, oh, I wonder where I should go. So I got on a plane and I flew to Silicon Valley and I drove around and I went, Intel, oh, Sun Microsystems, wow, this is where I've heard of these. And then I um, came back, I started to get the San Jose Mercury News, and then I saw this ad for this little company called Cisco. And when I started there, we made 60 routers a week. We made 10 a day. And when I left, we were 23 billion in sales and we were the world's um, um, the highest market cap of any company in the world. That opportunity to ride that up, to ride the internet, was a great experience and be part of a world-class organization. But what was really valuable was that I was always an entrepreneur, an innovator within Cisco. And I was constantly starting new organizations and creating my next job or whatever it was because I saw opportunities to add value. I left Cisco and I decided to do humanitarian work in Bolivia and Peru and mentor entrepreneurs. And I got down there and I looked at the whole model of humanitarian service and I thought, you know, I think there's a better way. And so this whole idea of developing businesses for poverty alleviation and social impact and uh, social entrepreneurship really became my passion. And so I built on that for a long time. And then I was asked to run economic development for Governor Huntsman. And so this whole idea of how they were going to do it was a little bit different. They decided to lay off all 35 people in economic development that had become a bit bureaucratic. And they asked me to come in and rebuild the whole program and to do it with a, a corporate culture and not a government culture. And so we were able to then lay the foundation for a lot of the strategy to build some of the tech sector here in Utah. I then decided to become a, a, go into private equity and ride this whole tech wave up in Utah, and that worked out very well for me. It also gave me a lot of time to be able to do adventures, which I love. And I did a lot of adventure racing, and then I started climbing mountains. And when I got here in Utah, I was like, what do people do here? And they said, oh, we climb mountains. I'm like, okay, cool. So then pretty soon I'm backcountry skiing and ice climbing and do all sorts of things. And then I've also had a couple businesses. I bought and sold Power Code, and I sold it for three times what I paid for it. We built that one up. And then ReadyNet I still have, and it's been longer and harder than I ever thought. But uh, we just got a massive customer, and it looks like the whole thing of ReadyNet is just going to just flourish. Um, ReadyNet does routers and things like that. I constantly had to reinvent myself. But that idea of identifying myself as an entrepreneur no matter whether I was working for Cisco. When I left, we were like 60,000 employees. In fact, one year at Cisco, we hired 18,500 people in one year. That's how fast we were growing. 
um, but not losing that adventure mindset. Now, one of the big questions I always get asked is, what do investors look for in an entrepreneur? So I have a feeling maybe some of you are thinking that. One of the first things I'd say is that there's a clear pain point that the market has, or sometimes they may recognize it, sometimes they don't, but the entrepreneur recognizes it and sees an opportunity to provide a solution. In fact, not only does it a solution, it ought to be a competitive or a sustainable competitive advantage. Maybe there's a way through either strategic partnerships or some other way to prevent other or create some barriers to entry. And then third, the thing that we look for the most is that we're not betting on the company. We're betting on you as entrepreneurs because just like in war, a business plan gets thrown out the window pretty often and you have to pivot. In fact, you have to know when to hold course or when to pivot and traverse and take a different tact. And it's the entrepreneur that knows when and how to do that. And some individuals who learn that instinctively when they're young, others have to learn with it experience. But those are some of the key things that investors are gonna look for. Then there's the obvious stuff, like being prepared. I can't tell you the number of times that I've had um, entrepreneurs come to me looking for money and <clears throat> They're like telling me the, there's nobody in the market. And there may be nobody in the market in Utah, but that provincialism comes out, and then all of a sudden I or some of my buddies in the, on the investment committee will be all of a sudden realizing we know of three other players already. The other thing that we want to look for is also this commitment to the business and a work ethic that just is off the charts. It has, to, it's heavy lifting. There's no getting around it. Whether you're climbing mountains or entrepreneurship, you just have to get comfortable with the heavy load. You have this monkey on your back and you'll carry it 24 by seven until you sell the business or move on. The other thing we really look for is your ability to build relationships. This ability to set a vision and then engage resources both that work for you and others in terms of strategic partners that you can build and align all to help you achieve your, your vision. The other thing I would say is don't be afraid to pursue what you're passionate about. The money will come if you hold out for it. This example of Dave Hahn, <clears throat> he was my idol when I started climbing. I heard about Dave Hahn, he'd been up 15 summits by then. He's probably done 20 by now. He gets paid like 75 grand every time he goes up Everest. I had to pay 75 grand every time I get up, uh, go up Everest. Well, I only done it once, but the whole idea there is that you can figure out how to make money and uh, build around that. The other thing I wanna say is that Utah is a great place to do business. It's a great place for entrepreneurship. More businesses start in Utah than any other state. There are more business failures here too, but there's some great, amazing resources for businesses. There's the business resource centers. There's also this great um, entrepreneurial legacy. Can you imagine coming into Logan Valley or coming into Salt Lake Valley and building out this whole thing? It's absolutely amazing to me how they figured out how to do that. But just like how Moab figured out and built off mountain biking, or Cedar City built off um, uh, the Shakespearean Festival. Salt Lake is a big hub for medical device companies and pharma. Um, Utah County is now you know, Web 2.0 and all the SaaS services. All of those come together and can be um, instrumental in strategically helping you be entrepreneurs. From Cisco, I, I learned some valuable lessons. I learned that Having a strong purpose is huge. Our the purpose was to change the way the world lives, works, plays, and learns. And uh, learn came later, but this whole idea of knowing why we're there and why we're doing something, and if you can convey that to investors, that sets you apart. The vision that we had was to make the internet ubiquitous. This, when I started, you guys have to appreciate it. It was 1990, people were just getting email. It was like a local network. And the whole idea of connecting up the entire world was way out there. 
And our mission was really to be the number one router manufacturer and to break away from the other competitors. And we did that through proactively changing and building strategic partnerships. And then obviously we had tangible goals to help us get there. Another thing you need to do as entrepreneurs is you have to be compelling and to think about what it is you're doing in a way that's gonna leave an emotional impact and a resonant. When you're trying to hire people, if you want them to come on board, you have to get them to engage emotionally with you. Same thing when you're selling. And obviously, if you're out fundraising, you've got to find a way to get people to emotionally care about what you're looking for. The other thing I often see, particularly in certain cultures of uh, larger organizations, <clears throat> is this lack of indecision and the inability to lower or push the decision-making process down to the lowest point in the organization and to train and coach people to be decisive. Companies have to move fast. And if you're gonna be first to market or you're gonna constantly iterate and go through that, it's okay to fail. The question is not whether you succeed or fail, the question is when you fail, how quickly can you course correct and then iterate to get out and be there. And it has to be about following that inner voice, empowering people to do it on their own so it doesn't always have to go up the chain for a decision, but you enable everybody to do that. You also have to be comfortable with ambiguity. There's so many unknowns, you always wish you had more information. That fear of not knowing enough always gets in the way, but just make decisions and go forward. And then the idea of communicating your message. Having a whole brand campaign that can drive a viral message across the internet. It is clear and concise and focused and not too diffused. We're into this, we're also into this, we're all over the place. It makes the investors very nervous. Start a movement if you can. Get everybody behind you and create this groundswell. So it isn't just you talking about this solution, but all of a sudden you've got a bunch of partners that are jumping into this whole ecosystem. And then just like Clark, you gotta take some calculated risks. You try to do everything you can to mitigate it and to reduce the chances that the laws of entropy are gonna get in your way, but then just take the leap of faith. Um, I have a healthy paranoia when I go sail around the world. It's something that puts me in a constant state of checking and making sure I know what the weather is, making sure I know how the boat's working, or taking all, doing all the homework, but all of that bring, comes together. The last, or one of the last things I'll say is about dealing with disappointments. This idea of thinking about disappointment as sometimes an opportunity. And this example of Steve Jobs, where he got fired from Apple, said it was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. It freed me to enter one of the most creative uh, periods of my life. Obviously with Pixar, with the, I, or the iPad, and then obviously the iPhone. That generation and that evolution wouldn't have come had he stayed in that status, status quo. He was forced out of his comfort zone, but then he had the opportunity to rethink how to all look at uh, the whole situation. The next thought is to be a really good judge of people. If you're gonna hire, I've hired hundreds and hundreds of people. I mean, literally, it's like four or 500 people, maybe three or 400. <clears throat> you have to be a good judge of people, and you have to take risks on people. And you don't always know their whole story, um, but you get a sense and to follow that intuition and see if they'll go on the journey with you. Um, do you guys recognize this team? Anybody? Who is it? Nobody? Take a hard look. Who are those guys? Beatles. Not quite. Look at the... <laughs> Look at the lower left. Microsoft. Microsoft? Who said that? Yeah, good job. See us old guys, we do know stuff. Um, that's Bill Gates in the lower left-hand corner. So um, Paul Allen was in there too. The other thing I will say, and this is really important, you have to identify industry trends and catch a wave. That little trend I caught was called the internet, and it turned out to be a very big wave but there have been waves all along. You look at people on the beach in, back in the 50s, they were all listening to transistor radios. And then in the 80s, we got the Walkman. 
And then we got iPhones with all everybody. What people wanted was personalized music and the ability to communicate. And this whole wave just constantly cycled through a number of products. So obviously, I hope many of you have read The Innovator's Dilemma and how to think about product cycles. And then also to this idea, as you're thinking about where your career should go, if you catch, oh, I don't know, say the um, personalized medicine and the whole revolution that's going on in, medicine, in the medical space right now. Obviously, Elon Musk is disintermediating uh, transportation. And obviously, he's taken on the commercialization of space at the same time. What a cool trailblazer. But look at those massive changes to those industries and how Tesla is now worth more than Ford and GM combined. So with that, I think those are my thoughts on entrepreneurship. Now I'd like to take you on a journey and maybe we'll start with climbing a few mountains. Are you with me? Yeah. All right. Let's talk about envisioning things and how do you envision that future summit that you want to go after. I was in doing a business consulting gig in India, in Delhi, and I flew up to Nepal to Kathmandu. And I decided, I'm like, wow, I'm, I was due on the weekend. And, and I flew around, I chartered this plane, and I flew around the Everest. And oh, by the way, there's like 80% of this picture, you can't see it's all below the clouds. And I just went, I can't believe how that mountain is so big. I can't understand how anybody could climb it. It was like too far out there. And it wasn't until a couple years after that that I started to think about it a little more and I decided to put myself in that picture. And I said to myself, well, what would it take for me to one day climb it? Who would I have to become? And what would I have to do in order to lay out a strategic game plan to get there? And so I did. I prepared in the Wasatch Mountains and learned to climb once I got to Utah. And just like Clark, I had to map out some of the strategy on how to get there. We had to do a couple prep climbs. This is Denali in Alaska, and it's the tallest mountain in North America. It's 20,000 plus feet, and it's actually colder than Everest. And this was my first full-on mountaineering ex expedition. And uh, everything before this was like a glorified hike. And now we're dealing with minus 40 degrees and minus 70 when you add the wind chill on it. Um, we had to work our way through these glacier system and then on up and climb the mountain. We had to haul a 50 pound pack, uh, maybe 55, and then we had to haul a 45 to 50 pound sled. And we'd hike or up on snowshoes through the glacier fields. And then by 14,000 feet, I had to pull two sleds because some of my buddies weren't able to make it. We also had to build these huge wind walls every time we stopped in order to prevent the tents from blowing away. And uh, we had to make and cut out all these ice blocks. So there's our expedition team. In fact, I'm there in the red on the right. My buddy Steve is in the middle with the big yellow boots. And these guys are like, whoa, look at us. We're so tough. We're like two. The two guys on the, on the left, they were uh, uh, New York City firefighters. And believe me, they're buff. And one of these guys is a Swiss mountaineer. But something interesting happened. As we started climbing and dealing with the weather, and it got cold, and we started to struggle up the mountains, these guys started to have a mental transformation. They started to let this anxiety build up inside them. This idea of like, I'm not sure I can do it. Oh, what about the weather? What about our gear? What about this? And then all of a sudden, you'd look in their eyes, and you'd be like, whoa, there's no way that guy's going to make it to the summit. And sure enough, maybe a day or two later, he'd be dropping out because of like physical pain. But it really was this whole mental anxiety. One of the things that I want you all to learn if we embrace this adventure mindset is this ability to manage your own anxiety, to recognize the situation. Clark looks fear. It's not like he doesn't feel fear. He sets it aside. He says, all right, fear, I get you. You're over there. I feel you. I know you're there, but this is what I'm going to do anyway. And just like hunger, we manage that in a way that enables us to be successful. We got to 17,000 feet. We were stuck in a storm. My buddy Steve got cerebral edema, 
And we tried to get them down, but we couldn't descend in the storm. We couldn't go down the ridge line. And we were stuck there for six days. And so this opportunity again to practice and keep myself on this edge between boredom and anxiety. How is this all going to play out? Were we going to run out of food? Were we, how are we going to manage through this? It's real, and it's real in entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs embrace risk over safety. We go out on the limb. We try stuff and make sure it comes together. Well, Steve and I got to the summit on day seven, and we celebrated in this photo. But two months after this photo, Steve died of a brain aneurysm at age 46. And I honored him by then saying, all right, I'm going to take on the seven summits. So I flew back to Nepal. And there's Kathmandu. You all are entrepreneurs. What, do you, what, do, what does this look like to you? What do you think that is? It's a milk truck, OK? That's how they deliver milk. Um, Kathmandu and Nepal are really poor. The average salary there is $400 a year. But what's interesting is because there are no jobs, everybody has an entrepreneurial mindset. Meaning if you know how to lay brick, you can get a job as a bricklayer, but nobody's going to hire you. You just got to get out and hustle. And so the other thing that's really amazing is to see how broad entrepreneurship is outside uh, the United States and some of these second and third world countries. That's the most dangerous airport in the world. And we land right in front. There's a cliff. And you see the wreckage of the planes. And then, oh, by the way, at the end of the runway, there's a mountain. And um, there's only 14 stripes on the runway. But you go up into the Khumbu region, and you start this 11-day trek into Everest Base Camp. Not only that, when you're going through there, you realize why there are no cars or trucks. And these people have never even seen a car. They have trails. And everything goes in on the back of a, a somebody's back or on a yak. And you realize just how hard these people work. We have such a comfortable life here in the United States. And so this whole idea of how hard can you work is great if you have the opportunity to really test yourself and to really find out. The Himalayas are 10 times bigger than what we have here in the Wasatch. And as you go in, you start to see all the climbers who died and the monuments that are in honor of them. And you're like, why am I here? What am I doing this again for? This is like, I do not want to end up with a bunch of stones over me. And so this whole idea of base camp at 17,000 feet, and then just, oh, by the way, if you don't believe Instagram, there's my wife, Kim. But that's how she really was. <laughs> there's base camp. And so this idea of teaming up and coming together as a team with strangers all over the world and forming this idea that we were going to take on this challenge. And the Everest is just a series of obstacles. We started with this whole idea of making it through the Khumbu Icefall. And there's an upper glacier, and it breaks up. And these big ice blocks, bigger than the stage, come tumbling down 15 feet a day. And you have to work your way up. There I am in the green, kind of going through the, the ice maze. And the other thing that's unnerving is you have to do it at night, when the ice is a little more stable. And one of the guys who hauled a big sled across Greenland, 250-pound sled, freaked out. And that anxiety got to him. He started throwing up. He couldn't control his anxiety. The limbic system took over the prefrontal cortex. And he had to drop out. The next challenge was the big crevasses, these big fissures in the ice. And I've got six-pound boots on. I've got crampons on, another pound and a half. And you have to cross these ladders with spikes on your legs while you hold on to these little ropes. And um, some of these ladders, you're looking down 1,000 feet. And you're working your way across. And the wind's blowing. Here's the big one. It's got five aluminum ladders lashed together. And as you step on it, the whole thing twists and turns. And you can't let that psych you out. Okay, You have to get across. And not only that, you have to get across multiple times every time you go up and down to acclimatize. What we're doing is we're physiologically overstressing our body so we build up more red blood cells so we can survive higher up on the mountain. Here's a challenge nobody taught me about on Everest. We're in the shadow down, down at the bottom. It's probably minus 25, maybe minus 30. 
within an hour in that sunny section, because it's a perfect reflector oven with the sides of the mountains on both sides and the sun just beating down, you can see the watch there. It's 100 degrees. And we were, water is really heavy, so we didn't take any. This whole idea of it being really hard and really sucked, okay? I can't tell you how, how, what a suffer fest it was. And yet we knew we were timed, and if we didn't make it to Camp 2 at 22,000 feet, we would have been cut from the summit team. And so we just pushed. Three guys dropped out in that little segment, just trying to get there. At 22,000 feet, you now you don't have enough oxygen. Your body's completely spent. If you cut your finger, it won't heal. In fact, there's not even enough oxygen to digest protein. So you're way out of your comfort zone. Your body's starting to, to break down. In fact, to give you an idea, I lost 18 pounds on Everest on the 51 days it took me to climb Everest. 18 pounds for me is a lot of weight. Um, you just can't take in enough calories. And you're there at 22,000 feet, and you're looking up at the shoulder of Everest, and you're like, there's no way. There's no way I can get up there. And yet you have to figure out how you're going to do it. That's not even the summit. That's just a shoulder. The next big challenge is called the Lhotse face. And this big uh, face, I'm going to zoom in, in that, but right next to, that, to the right side of that smooth section. And I'll zoom in again to give you an idea just how massive that is. And now you can just make out the climbers, those little dots, making it up the Lhotse face. There I am. I always thought we'd all be climbing together on a rope line, but it's actually more efficient if everybody goes at their own pace. You've got to kind of work your way up the, the sheer ice face. And in the morning, it'd be really sunny, but by afternoon, the weather would drop in and it'd be a complete whiteout. And you can see I'm in my big down suit. <clears throat> We got up to Camp 3 a number of times to acclimatize at 25,000 feet. And then we were spending the night. And this huge storm came in and ripped out the tents. And we had to go all the way back down to base camp. And so there I am at the bottom. And I'm so physically, emotionally spent. And I remember calling my wife on the sat phone. And I said, honey, I'm done. I have nothing left. And she said, well, do you want to come home? And I said, I am done. And she said, well, do you have to leave in the morning to go back up? And I said, no. And she said, well, great. And I go, what do you mean great? And she says, great, because you don't have to make a decision tonight about what you're going to do. And so she said, just check out. Separate yourself from the whole thing and just try to recover tomorrow. So that night, I watched Finding Nemo on my iPad, OK? <laughs> and I'm sitting there crying, OK? I got to be honest with you. Tears are coming down my eyes. Or, and um, there's Dory's telling me, just keep swimming, OK? <laughs> and I'm like, no, I can't keep swimming. There's no way, all right? And this is like ridiculous, OK? And there I am arguing, thinking of, with myself, talking to myself, trying to find a way to get there. And I finally got to the point where I said, you know what, if I ever want to be instrumental in, in inspiring other people to do hard things, I better find a way. So that next day then, we rested. And then the following day, I got back up and climbed back up to Camp uh, 3 and then kept going. And now I'm at Camp 4 at 26,000 feet. And now the real technical part of the climb starts. And uh, just like any big goal, you have to break it down into milestones, like the balcony and the Hillary step. And you have to break each of those milestones down into goals. And in, for our case, it was rope lengths. And each of those stars was a rope length that we had to go down of a couple hundred yards. And then from there, each of the uh, rope lengths, I had to break into steps. And some of those steps, I had to break into breaths. And sometimes it would take between five and 10 breaths to make it up one uh, step. So there I am in my oxygen. You can see the south summit behind me. You can see the camera is still pretty cold on Everest. And here I am working my way up the Hillary step. And I'm crossing this ridge. And I've got 10,000 foot drop below my right hand. And then below my feet is about a 6,000 foot drop. And I'm on this little ice step. 
and trying to wait my turn to go up the Hillary step. And then I work my way up through there, and then I come up and figure out, talk to my uh, Sherpa about which, which are the ways, um, which rope I need to connect up to and kind of teamwork there. And then I come up to the summit plateau, and you can see the prayer flags behind me. And this whole idea of, although it's from here to the food truck out there, it's like a half hour trip. And this whole idea, you can see I'm hunched over. In fact, that guy in the red made it to the summit just ahead of me, but he was so spent, he couldn't even stand up and be part of the summit photos. So there we are, we celebrated at the top. We, we tried to catch our breath. We realized how cold it was. And then you have to make a statement, right? You're up on Everest. So I told my family I love them. I honored my friend Steve. And then I took out the UVU flag because I didn't have a Utah State flag. <laughs> and I planted on the summit. But the whole reason I did that was this whole idea of getting as much education as you can and to share with you students to really make sure you complete your education and not sell yourself short because your education will take you anywhere you want to go in life. From there, that's the summit looking out, or the view looking out over the summit of Everest. You're actually looking out over uh, uh, Tibet at that point, uh, the Tibetan plateau. And it's kind of surreal to be up there and to have that perspective and to, to cherish that moment of achievement and accomplishment and to realize all the things that had to come together to be able to do that. From there, I went on and did a couple more climbs. I went through uh, Elbrus in Russia. And an interesting thing happened up there. We climbed and we got to the summit relatively easy. And we're like, whoa, there I am in the middle in the green. Yeah, look at us. We're so cool. And on the way down, that guy in blue in the front is a big guy. He's like 270s, the coach of the Russian Climbing Federation. And he decides to go out in front of us. And unlike the rest of us who are all roped up, he's saying, no, I know, I know what I'm doing. I know everything. I got, I got this. And all of a sudden, I watch. And he just goes, poof. And he disappears. And he wedged himself 40 feet down in a crevasse. And we spent hours as a team coming together. And we went from being this victory team to being a search and rescue operation in order to pull him out of that crevasse. And it really showed me something, that a hardship, when a team goes through a hardship and a real trial by fire, that the identity of that team comes out of there. And as we got everything back together, we were completely different about who we were as individuals and what we thought we could accomplish. It was a whole different transformative experience for me. From there, I went on and climbed in Indonesia. This is West Papua and this idea of taking risks and going forward to manage to get across this Tyrolean Traverse to get up the ridge line. And then in Antarctica, I had the joy and the privilege of being a, uh, achieving the seventh summit. <clears throat> and from there, enjoying and celebrating that moment. From there, I went on and I cross country skied to the South Pole. So I wouldn't lose momentum, I kept going. In fact, if you want to know what that's like, it's all about going forward nonstop across that glacier for days. Guys, I'm so thrilled that I've been able to constantly challenge myself to take on one adventure after another. I've obviously sailed around the world. I've sailed the uh, seven seas. I made it, it was the 83rd boat to make it through the Northwest Passage. Up over Alaska, through the Bering Sea, up over Alaska, across northern Canada, and down the coast of Greenland. One of my favorite accomplishments I've done. Sailing from China to Seattle, nonstop, 6,500 miles as part of a race in which a woman died and drowned. That opportunity to test ourselves with 35-foot waves and a real challenge was one of the toughest things I've done as I was constantly seasick and on watch for four hours and off watch and couldn't sleep. And I'm totally hammered and we have to keep going. All of that to appreciate you know, the other good things in life like family. I've learned that mountains have taught me that I can achieve more than I ever thought possible. And oceans have taught me that we can navigate our way through life. 
that we can find a way to make good decisions and course correct when we get knocked off course with a storm. I'm so grateful for adventure in my life because it's enabled me to come away with a bigger sense of myself, of who I am and what I can accomplish. And I challenge each of us to constantly find our Everest and to go after it. So with that, thank you all very much. I think we have time for a couple questions. Clark, why don't you come back up? And I'm going to do one thing because I think you'll, uh, would you guys like to see a, a couple minute video on what it was like on that sailboat? Yeah. All right, we'll skip some of that. That's what sailing down the coast of Antarctica looks like. All right. Um, I've lost my mouse. That's what going to the North Pole looks like. And I made my little claim for science up there at the North Pole. This is the boat I sailed across the, North, uh, the, uh, the Pacific with. And then I'll close on this little video. I think you guys will like it. Sorry. That shouldn't have been that hard. Crap. Oh, that really sucks. Okay, never mind. Sorry, you don't get to see the video. Let's, uh, I'll pull it up, uh, but Clark, come on out here, grab the mic. And then uh, for either for entrepreneurship or adventure or challenges, what questions do you guys have? How can we help sh enable you guys to be successful on your journey as you're still figuring out what those summits are and how do you get up there? Anything? Yeah, go ahead. What strategies do you guys have for conquering anxieties? Clark? Um, there's a weird switch that kind of happens in my mind where before you jump, it can be super scary and intense. And then after you've jumped, you, there's almost no emotion. Like you're just reacting and you're calm and you're not all revved up. It's not how you would imagine, like all scared or freaked out and like, oh my gosh, I might hit this or this could happen. But it's before you act that you have all of that fear. And so for me, I'll always think about, okay, you know, I've done this to prepare, I've done this to prepare, I've done this to stack the odds in my favor. I go over everything in my mind and I'm like, this should work, you know, I believe that it will. And then, that helps me calm down enough to jump. And then after I've taken that initial step, after I beat the inertia, that's what, I mean, I think that's the biggest thing is just beating that inertia. Because after you're going, you're going, so. Can I add to that? Because that's a really important question. I uh, got a chance to meet the head of uh, training for the Navy SEALs. And I asked him, I said, is it in the hoorah and this psyched up, you know, guys that are go out and do hard things like run up uh, down a machine gun nest? Or um, is it in that calm, peaceful, centered space? When I'm, I've skinned up a mountain and I'm standing there watching the sunrise, and all of a sudden I feel like it just all comes together, and I'm sort of at one with, my, with, the, with the world, and I just feel like I could do anything. And he said, Martin, I studied for four years to be a Buddhist monk before I became a Navy SEAL. He said, which do you think it really is? Do we psych ourselves up and is that the way to go and get that cortisol spewing through our brain? Or is it really about this calm, centered approach as we take on whatever challenges come our way? And do we then have a clearer head to mitigate and manage risk and to avoid challenges and problem solve? That's one of the most important things I think young entrepreneurs can learn. Even like uh, taking final exams, right? You get psyched up and you sometimes get overly psyched. And so that's the same lesson there. So great question, thanks. Anything else? Yeah. You know, it's a funny question, this idea of danger. I, I, I think what he does is dangerous, and 
I won't go do that stuff, all right? You're not going to see me in a wingsuit, although actually I, was, I did a, a simulation of a wingsuit. Um, but the reality is, uh, sailing and do, doing all my adventures, I never felt like I was about to die. Um, and so I stayed within that self-defined definition of adventure, but not danger. Entertainment is over here, danger is over here, and adventure is somewhere in the middle. And entrepreneurship, if you think about it, what's the worst that can happen? You lose a lot of money, you go home, and you live with your parents in the basement, okay? And eventually you'll work your way out of debt. That's the worst that can happen. Maybe you embarrass yourself or something like that. But those fears aren't danger. Anything you want to add to that? Um, for me, it's just been something I've been naturally drawn to, and it's something I really love. Uh, I definitely don't think that, I would never justify it and say it's safe, but I think a lot of the awesome things in life aren't safe. So I think if you love it, if you're passionate about it, it's worth it. And if you're not super passionate about it, then maybe don't take that risk. That's why us normal people don't do what he does. <laughs> what other questions? Yeah. No, are you kidding? <laughs> so actually, I had an idol growing up. His name was Jacques Cousteau. And I thought I wanted to be a marine biologist. In fact, I studied French for six years. So I'd be ready when I got to the Calypso to speak French with Jacques Cousteau. The reality was my parents took me to some uh, marine biologists. And I said, what do you guys do? And you know, tell me about the job and you know, all that kind of stuff. And I had envisioned being um, like in a scuba diving wetsuit with a really cool um, scuba packer on my back. And they said they, they go out on a boat about once a month and trawl a mile down and they, they spend the rest of the month in the lab classifying what they found. I went, yuck, I don't want to be a marine biologist. So um, we learn as we go and things evolve and from there I decided maybe marine engineering or oceanography, and then from there I became a mechanical engineer because I was always fixing stuff. Uh, you're talking to a guy who mounted a, a Briggs and Stratton engine on my little uh, my my bicycle. In fact, I didn't even have a rear brake or just a front brake, but I designed the the uh, gear gearing and the and the clutch system so that I could either pedal it or have the motor work. And I was so proud that I figured a way to do that. And it went 53 miles an hour. And I was like, wow, pretty cool. <laughs> so uh, that's the kind of stuff that really led me into mechanical engineering. Engineering, fortunately, taught me how to solve problems. And then as I quickly moved up, I, I was only an engineer for like a, you know, a year. And then I got promoted into management because I put in this huge cost savings, saved the company 2.8 million. And all of a sudden, they're like, OK, you're now a manufacturing manager. And then from there, it's all been management. But the ability to solve problems, business problems, engineering problems, has been such a key part. And being just able to see the forest for the trees and not get caught in the weeds is a big part of that. Yeah, anything else? All right. Yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite parts of air sports, and there's all these different disciplines, like there's skydiving, which you all know, there's wingsuit base jumping, which we watched the video of, there's ski base with the parachute, or there's speed flying and paragliding where you can hike up all these mountains around like Utah State or Salt Lake and fly down the mountain. But one of the coolest things is like when you're in free fall and with, you're with your buddy and you can look over and you can be like, whoa, like see him smiling. And you're like, dude, this is crazy. And, I don't know, that's, that's honestly one of my favorite, like, just small examples of like sharing that flight with someone else. Uh, yeah, it's a crazy feeling. And then um, it's just incredible to me that you can go up something high, whether it be a cliff that you're jumping off of or a mountain that you're flying off of, and actually fly down. So the closest example is like if you've ever skied powder, it's pretty similar feeling to powder. I've skied powder, it's not like it's, it at all. <laughs> it's through the air though, so. Yeah, it's awesome. 
hey, Adam, I'll, I'll, I'll make a deal with you, okay? You ever get down to Provo? Well, next time you're down to Provo, you call me. We'll get you into the, there's a new company that's just launching this July, and they do jump simulations. And they'll put you in a wingsuit, they'll bring you up on a big trapeze thing, and you'll be up there, and you'll simulate the whole thing flying down with uh, uh, augmented reality. So you'll have an opportunity to do that if you give me, connect up with me later. I'll send you down there. And then you'll know what it's like, all right? <laughs> And believe me, your knees are going to be shaking, I promise you, and you're standing on this virtual cliff, and it's amazing what uh, VR will do. Yeah? Whether it be in business or any of the other great things you've ever done, like, or any aspect of your life, what's been like, the scariest moment of your life, and how have you gone past that? Oh, man, that's a great story. So <clears throat> I'm sailing along through the Indian Ocean, just south, like 100 miles south of Madagascar. And I'm sailing along, there's a massive lightning storm on the horizon. We're like, holy cow, all right? So we're like, let's turn around and go the other way. So we do a 180, and all of a sudden we realize that that storm is overtaking us, and there's no way we can outrun it. And we're like, man, look at all that lightning. And so we had to turn around again and realize if we go through it faster, we're going to have less chance of getting hit than if we go with it, all right? So there we are, we turn around and we're going through the storm and there's lightning bolts piling into the water around us and I'm, I've got a 94 foot mast, okay? It is an aluminum lightning rod that says, come here, okay? Hit me. And I'm just sweating bullets, okay? I really did. I thought for sure all the electronics, everything was going to go and I didn't know what would happen to us and I just, I, I can't believe we made it through that storm. So that was probably the the hairiest experience I had. Um, and, you know, I've had lots of challenges where the adrenaline is going and I try to calm that, tap that back down, but that was one that was hard to control. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. What's your scariest one, man? <laughs> you know, I can't quite say it's going through a lightning storm. <laughs> That's all right. I mean, it's different for all of us, right? But sometimes it's just a, man, I got to get through this as fast as I can, or I gotta just say, all right, it's gonna be scary and hairy for the next, you know, 30 seconds. And guess what? Our prefrontal cortex can take command of our limbic system, right? The limbic system is where the fight, flight, or freeze response is, and we can master that. And the more, that's why we practice mindfulness, this opportunity to exercise our prefrontal cortex ability to control our limbic system. And then it's amazing. You look at Alex Hinald, right? And the free soloing uh, uh, El Cap. The whole idea behind that is he's mastered that over and over again, year over year, um, so that he doesn't have those fear responses physiologically. Does that make sense? Cool. Anything else? Yeah. How do you analyze which opportunities to take on? Do you have regrets from missed opportunities in the past? Do I ever have regrets on missed opportunities? Let me tell you something. You guys have never, how many of you are wearing stance socks? Anybody? Nobody? Yeah, you gotta have stance socks, right? They're all over the place. Well, I'm in a meeting and this guy walks out on stage, he's pretty shaggy, and he's like, oh man, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna like, we're gonna make a gazillion dollars. We're gonna, we're gonna take, we've got these snowboard mitts and we're gonna put really cool snowboarders uh, logos on, the, on their snowboard mitts. And we're, everybody's gonna buy it. I mean, it's gonna go viral, we're gonna take over the world. I'm like, yeah, right, okay. Do you have a business plan? No. Um, what is all of that? So all of a sudden, you know, Stance goes and gets re-engineered and they bring in some additional management and the whole thing starts taking off. And now no matter, I've been all over the world, I've been, when I sailed around the world, I hit 39 countries and I think Stance was in every one. It's unbelievable how they've taken over. And they just started with socks, and they didn't, now they're NBA official and Major League Baseball sponsored. They created a buzz and a viral dynamic around socks, and they said, our socks are cooler than all everybody else's socks. And they got all these endorsements, and they actually figured out how to do that. I don't know if they ever made a snow mitt with a, a snowboarder on it, but that's what they were able to pull off. I didn't see that one. I didn't see a lot, but I am also grateful that I avoided a lot of ones that crashed, and I was maybe a little more conservative. And the risks I did take, and when I felt right about it, I went in big, 
And from an investor standpoint, it worked out amazingly well. Does that answer that? Is that Barrett, by the way? Yeah. Okay, Barrett, guess what? You have the opportunity with Drew to go skiing with Clark. And he's going to take you and rip you down a few mountains. So good luck on that one. I won't be there. Um, anyway, thank you all very much. I really appreciate it. Let's give it. a round of applause. Thank you. On behalf of the Entrepreneurship Center, we just want to um, offer you a, a small gift. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's get one more round of applause. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. It was a blast.